Um, all right, uh, first, before we get started, um, uh, I think I do this every time I give an introduction, but really, uh, in all sincerity, I'd like to thank Joyce again, who's doing so much right now to lead the uh, new MFA program and, uh, and everything else that happens in creative writing, including this reading series. She keeps uh, uh, people coming and uh, has really done a great job, so uh, thank you. Uh, also, thanks to um, Jennifer Garfield, our assistant in the MFA program, who's uh, you know, uh, putting up with all sorts of uh, panicky emails and, uh, and sending her own very sober and informative ones, uh, <laughs> events like this one. So, um, many things. So, it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce Nicholas Delbanco. He is the author of over 20 books, including his most recent novel, The Count Concord. He's won countless honors, among them two National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships and Guggenheim Fellowship. He's the Robert Frost Collegiate Professor of English and the director of the Hopwood Awards at the University of Michigan, where he has developed one of the nation's leading MFA programs in creative writing. In addition to his teaching and writing, he has served the larger community of writers in this country by chairing the National Book Awards panel. In a word, Nick is a distinguished person of letters, a writer who has given as much to his students and other writers as he has to his own work. While he has produced many moving novels, he's not limited his work to fiction. His books of nonfiction include The Countess of Stanline Restored, an intriguing history of a famous cello as it is dismantled and repaired, and the group portrait, Conrad, Crane, Ford, James, and Wells, a book dedicated to writers who taught him his craft. What I admire most about Nick's writing is its range and daring. In his 2004 novel, The Vagabonds, he sketches a gorgeous portrait of a family who unexpectedly receives a large chunk of money after the death of a parent. The book moves fluidly between family members, giving us a full sense of their past and presence and their expectations of future suddenly changed by money. At the same time, The Vagabonds makes use of some intriguing early 20th century history concerning Thomas Edison, Harvey Firestone, and Henry Ford. These two desperate strands come together brilliantly. In another recent novel that also doubles as a memoir, What Remains, Nick gives us a moving portrait of a family fleeing Nazi Germany. This book, too, is concerned with inheritance, what is handed down through the generations and what is left of past experience. It also explores the relationship between memory and art that can lead to good fiction. When one of his adult characters returns to London where he lived as a child, he misremembers the address of his boyhood home. Instead of bemoaning this as a failure, he celebrates it as a novelist might, thinking, though it seems funny and just a touch sad that history should prove so subject to revision, I've come to feel grateful for inexactness, the gift, as it were, of invention. Nick is as gifted a teacher as he is a writer. I had the privilege of being a student of Nick's in the mid-90s at the University of Michigan's MFA program. He was one of those rare teachers who could be both brutally and constructively honest. He was a fantastic teacher who showed all of his students an inordinate amount of generosity. I remember the final night of our graduate workshop. He invited us to his home and after we completed the work of the workshop, we ate a delicious meal and drank plenty of wine. And then we listened to Nick talk about his own career as a writer, his most encouraging and sec successful times and some not so encouraging times. He also told us stories of the writers he'd known well, John Gardner, Donald Barthelme, and Bernard Malmud, among others. His stories were lively, funny, and full of unforgettable details. Like everything Nick did that semester, this night of eating and conversation made us feel like writers among other writers. I know that all of my peers in that workshop felt as I did, that we had gained something from that semester that was absolutely necessary and important to persisting and carrying on with our craft. And so I'm especially glad 
We have Nicholas Del Banco with us here this afternoon. Please join me, join me in welcoming. on that rack back there, uh, a novel that came out a, a year and a half ago or so uh, called Spring and Fall. And I will be happy uh, to talk about that uh, with you afterwards if indeed there are questions you have about it. Um, but as I said at lunch with a bunch of other writers, it's the sort of disease that a writer calls health to think that every word they've written is rotten and every word they're about to write is terrific. And, and therefore, I, I would rather be reading from what is as yet unpublished than from what is, at the moment, my most recent published novel. This thing, The Count of Concord, also available in your better local bookstore, is um, uh, not going to be part of the big bad world for a couple more months. And I will do what writers uh, tend to do uh, and uh, rack it around the country, flogging my uh, wares. Uh, but I haven't done it yet. This is, in fact, I suppose, a technical inaugural. And I really wanted, in the presence of friends, to just try it out, to see what it sounds like. Uh, I'll be heartily sick of it by September. But, uh, uh, but at the end of March, it's a genuine excitement. Um, so, bear with me. Um, this book is going to take some explaining. It's only 500 pages long, and since the door is locked, um, you'll be here, shall we say, Thursday afternoon. Um, I, it, it is a sufficiently complicated construct, so that I don't really see much point in trying to bring you up to speed in the whole thing. We can talk about it somewhat afterwards. But I thought because this ought to be self-explanatory, or at least need no introduction, I would read a couple of pages from the introduction. In other words, this is what you would open to. Prologue, dated 1814. They laughed at him. They watched him pass. Fond mothers drew their sons to the embrasure of the window and peering pointed him out. Formidable, they whispered, extraordinary. It is something to remember and tell your children's children you have seen. Look. Around the corner, rattlingly, the Count appeared. Along the Avenue de Terre, and stopping to collect his glass beyond the Place de Terre, around the corner, well concealed and from French spies disguised, the beakers and alembics privately prepared for him, the necks in their tight spirals blown according to his secret and exact specifications. These coded in his assistant's German so that the envious, incompetent, calumniating locals could neither copy nor take the credit. From Boulevard du Bois le Prêtre, along the Avenue de Clichy and out at its high gate, from Malzère, along the Boulevard des Batignolles, or to the north, Bertier, Bessier, he made his great processioner. One coach. The women stared. They smiled at him. They smiled. They cradled their young sons and kissed them on the cheeks. You must not forget this, darling, what you see. And little Jean or Claude or Michel or Philippe would approach the window, greatly daring, and promise to remember, and press a cold nose to the glass. They called their daughters also. Come and watch us. Remember, they said. The worldly ones, the eligible, gazed boldly down at his carriage. The modest averted their eyes. No window was unoccupied, no doorway empty where he passed. Old women peered through the folds of the drapes. Old men muttered sagely or shook their powdered heads. Servants caught a glimpse or tried to, jostling for position by the garden wall, the braven ones brave passage in the street. There, his horses thundered. 
four white stallions draped in white. They did not require blinders. Their manes and tails were clipped. Air escaping from the matched team's nostrils plumed. Black hooves struck sparks from the cobblestone paving. The coach doors bore his crest. His wheels were twice the width of wheels on any other equipage. The fellows broad and stable. This affected to his satisfaction and by his own particular design. While clattering around the corner in mud or snow, on hill or ice or thoroughfare, his commands <clears throat> did not lead. The Count wore white. It is seemlier in winter, he maintained. It gives back the sun's irradiating heat. From head to toe, from cap to boot, from cape to glove, he clothed himself entirely in that glacial hue. Both he and his horses advanced. <clears throat> Wherever mad, brilliant, famous, ancient Count Rumford went that season was a sensation. All Paris observed him, all gaped. He moved as if impervious through clamor and derision and applause and whistling fuss. At times he doffed his cap, then tightened the fur to his neck. For what was extraordinary to the populace was to, their object, to the object of their wonder simplicity itself. He smiled and waved and bowed from the waist, or he paid La Foule no notice and drove on. I said this would take some explaining, and I suspect you deserve a little. Um, uh, the guy I'm writing about, uh, Count Rumford, was born not far from here in Woburn, Massachusetts. Uh, in 1753. Uh, and um, he had an interesting, a complicated, a various, a remarkable career. Uh, but I would guess that almost nobody in this room has ever heard of him. Um, you have, sir. Yes, sir. Bravo. Uh, then you will correct me when I go wrong. Um, Franklin uh, Roosevelt called him together with uh, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Edison, one of the three most, uh, Thomas Jefferson, one of the three most remarkable minds uh, that America has produced. And you all know a lot about the other two. Um, in fact, maybe you're tired of hearing about them, but you haven't heard, with that eminent exception, about Count Rumford um, or Benjamin Thompson because he picked the wrong side during the Revolutionary War. He wasn't short a traitor, and he got out of town and country as fast as he could, and lived uh, the bulk, the, the vast bulk and rest of his life abroad, dying in the Paris of 1814 that I've just described. Um, what else do I need to tell you to begin with? Uh, you know more about him than you think you do. Uh, you use his baking powder. You use his uh, invention of a coffee machine. Every fireplace uh, you ever sat by uh, was modified and improved by Count Rumford. There are some who argue that he was the father of nuclear physics because he understood the nature of heat transmission better than anyone else. There is a Rumford Medal at Harvard still. But, and if you were in, if you lived in Europe, you would know him because there he's much celebrated for the various countries he lived in and the various um, things he did. Uh, let me tell you about his name, and then I'll stop, or I'll keep going. Um, he was a social climber. Um, started poor, ended up rich. And he did that in mostly by conjoining two rich and elderly ladies. And the first of them uh, was the richest widow in Concord, New Hampshire, uh, whom he married when he was 19 and she was 42. Um, and uh, he, and when he ran away and people said he misbehaved, he said, she married me, not I, her. <laughs> I'm hoping you'll fall a little bit in love with this old rogue. But uh, the point of the story thus far is that New Hampshire and Massachusetts were arguing uh, for their borders, their boundaries. This was still the very early colonial period. And when they finally agreed, 
and set the border as the Merrimack River and said this is Massachusetts, that's for not Rhode Island. They changed the name of Rumford, Massachusetts, which had been to Concord, New Hampshire, which it became in order to celebrate the agreement with Concord. And so when he became, as he did, in fact, uh, a count of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the emperor asked him, what do you want to call yourself? Uh, you can pick any name you want. And he said, I'm going to call myself Count Rumford in honor of that which is forgotten. OK. I have been writing this book, God Help Me, and by extension, you, for some uh, two decades, uh, 22 years, in fact, and off and on, uh, mostly enthralled to, uh, to the Count himself and trying to learn uh, everything I could about him. Uh, but at a certain point, it occurred to me that we needed some kind of um, intervening presence, some sort of contemporary narrator. And since I take it that most of you are interested in writing, I, I'm shameless about filling in these blanks. Uh, after a 10-year interval or so, I figured out I needed a narrator. And I want to introduce you to her, though. This is, by now is page 168, and you've spent quite a lot of time in her presence before. Um, her name uh, is Sally. Uh, she's an elderly woman living in Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, this is not your first introduction to her, but it's part of her history. And I thought to read this to you because I'm told that uh, some of you have read the second chapter of Spring and Fall, which was about um, being an undergraduate in Harvard at Radcliffe in the bad old days of the 1960s. Um, and this is another version of that. And you can hear, I would hope, how different it is um, in part because of the different narrative voice. What do you need to know of me, reader, and why I write this book? Which are, as Thompson might have asked, the relevant particulars? How much must I explain? Since he's gone now forever and ever from the New England I call home, perhaps we should start here by providing, as it were, my local bona fides. I attended Radcliffe College, which was as close as a woman could come to matriculation at Harvard in the late 1950s, and a good deal more than young Ben Thompson managed 200 years before. He attended lectures for an afternoon or three. I took the full four years. Our author and your humble servant lost her prized virginity, though the misplacement was intentional, in Winthrop House on the third floor in what I think was entry K and during parietal hours. The word means nothing now, but then parietal meant opportunity, the time to be alone together behind the bedroom door. Who I was alone with, a boy called Billy Proctor, had pimples all over his back. We met in art history class, class, and by the 16th century were cuddling in the 16th row while the professor used his lighted pointer to illuminate the finer points of Brunelleschi's stairwell or Mantegna's Christ. And by the time he spoke of Rubens's nudes and traced Titian's fleshly drapery or Gainsborough's American, we two were playing pat cake in the instructive dark. It was an education, and astronomer John Winthrop, whose lectures roused Baldwin and Thompson, could not have been more excitable, uh, could not have had more excitable an audience than we were in Cambridge that spring. I loved the place. The taste of hot corn beef on rye, the look of the commons in snow. I can conjure with no trouble the musty book thick smell of stacks in Widener Library, the sound of traffic on Linnean Street. I loved the square, the lights of the Agassiz Theater at night, the banks of the Charles River, the first Congregational Church Cemetery, its ancient rain slicked stones, its honored dead, the coffee cooling in haze big while we smoked our cigarettes. I gave the habit up, of course, smoking, not coffee, once they proved beyond doubt how lethal it was. But now when I remember college, I see an ashtray, a matchbook, a smoldering cigarette tip. We had long, earnest arguments about society and politics, nature versus nurture, and free will versus determinism. 
In secret, I wrote poetry, those ballads and sonnets and villanelles on which we cut our eye teeth then. The vocalic distinction of promise and premise, its single simple variable, seemed to me profound. I studied French and German history and literature, and under supervision read Max Weber and Albert Camus. On my own, thereafter, I discovered, and was sure I'd done so on my own, Simone Weil and Simone de Beauvoir. My tutor was a nervous man who knew that he'd not receive tenure. In April of our senior year, according to the story, he shot himself by accident while cleaning his pistol in Maine. Somehow, when we learned of this, it seemed an admission of weakness, a gesture in poor taste. Uh, she's pretty awful through our narrative. Isn't she? <laughs> Astride a bicycle with a green book bag stuffed in its basket, I felt as though I'd learned the password to some secret kingdom, or if not secret, privileged, where the chosen few could meet and wrangle with the chosen few. And my thesis was a comparison of two poems on the same subject. Rainer Maria Rilke's Geburt der Venus and Jose Maria de Heredia's La Naissance d'Aphrodite. How's that for pretension, gentle reader? I'd fallen under Rilke's spell and thought his letters to a young poet were written directly to me. All that business about the lighthouse, the maiden and the castle wall, those breathy self-dramatizations and pins to love as a bordering protective solitude, all that romantic posturing rang true. The other poem, On the Birth of Venus on the Half Shell, was written by a justifiably obscure French Panacean poet, Heredia, who'd been raised in Cuba and wasn't even French. But I analyzed the texts, translated them, and labored over what I called, portentously enough, birth and death of an object. Is it any wonder that I found myself one raw match March afternoon in Winthrop House unbuttoning Proctor's white shirt. He himself was a student of physics. He'd been enrolled in a seminar on the history of science, and I remember his high-toned disquisitions on Copernicus and Kepler and Tycho Brahe and the rest. I remember also his roommate's sniggering compliance, the sudden appointment he had, or so Billy reminded him, in Boston, the abrupt solemnity with which we pulled down the shade. My lover's future and my own were, to use his language, asymptotic. That's as much as I learned about solid geometry, ever. Asymptotes are parallels that cannot converge in the Euclidean plane, but may in space intersect. Not so for our young scholars class. Though we met in our little infinity, the parallel lines we inscribed on his bed were slated to diverge. He went to Brookhaven, I think, and later into business. A class note for our 25th anniversary report said he had two children grown and one grown old divorced. But it was Billy Proctor who first pronounced Count Rumford in my presence. And that's why he enters this narrative, taking two sorts of innocence away from the untutored girl I'd been. I left him with a bloody sheet to send to laundry service and he left me to finish up a paper on phlogiston that was three days overdue. What's phlogiston, anyhow, I can remember asking. And he said it was a bad idea, but one that served its purpose for a while. He couldn't explain it. He zipped up his pads, but had to get over to Widener and finish the damn thing. You mean me? I asked him. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, when you said it was a bad idea, it will be better the next time, he said. It always is the second time. Then he pulled on his loading coat and held out mine for me. I shrugged myself into its arms, attempting not to cry. We do tend to take these things personally, don't we? We remember them quite clearly, though it's very long ago. I knew about the Parnassien and love as a bordering protective solitude, but didn't know why Billy talked about phlogiston as an idea whose time had passed. All that stuff he was trying to tell me about the nature of transmitted warmth and boring the emperor's cannon in Munich and how heat could not be substantive, his whole mumbled explanation to a girl who wanted nothing more than that he'd say, you're wonderful, see you tomorrow, seemed, if not evasion exactly, 
a form of veiled reproach. And it took more than 40 years for me to come to understand how he had been a virgin too and desperate to cultivate an attitude. It always is the second time. I needed some premeditated something cool to say. I borrowed his scarf, I remember, and remember bleeding blad badly and hating, hating Count Rumford and the Rumford professor at Harvard who had assigned the text. Parietals were over. It was time to pedal home. When next we meet our narrator, it's 1969. I'm older class and wiser now and living in the hills. Those were the years, remember, of what we called the counterculture. And yours truly entered same with something of a vengeance. I'm standing at the kitchen sink of a farmhouse in upstate New York. It has four chimneys, it's built out of brick, and me and my companion are heating it with wood. I'm 31 years old. I do the cooking and she does the cleaning and neither of us does it well. My soups are indistinguishable one from the other. My loaves of bread rarely rise. The woman that I live with, Adriana, has an abiding respect for the natural world and wouldn't dream of dusting it. <laughs> We've been together nine months. I love the long white curve of her throat, the thick blonde hair she wears in braids, the comfort we provide each other in the double bed. We heap the mattress high with quilts bought in a local antique shop called Hen and Chick, and the brass headboard could profit from polishing, and the box springs a disaster but neither of us care. There are baskets of rank smelling wool. Adriana is a weaver who takes her inspiration from the spider webs that, when the sun slants through the room, display themselves intricately along the bookshelves and the curtain rods, elaborately linking from wall to wall. I'm shivering. It's cold. Beyond the kitchen window on the poor pasture that belongs to our poor neighbor, there are Holstein cows. What cash we require for day-to-day -day living, I earn by teaching French. In the intervening years, I've traveled and improved my, improved my accent and learned to scorn Heredia and given up composing ballads, sonnets, villanelles. Now I work as an adjunct tutor at the local prep school, though what these kids were being prepped for, it's difficult to say. Mostly, they're delinquents the children of the middle class who've been thrown out of Hotchkiss or Concord Academy, the ones who've dropped too much acid or stolen the Porsche once too often, but whose parents aren't quite ready yet to relinquish the idea of Bryn Mawr or Yale. My own degree from Harvard has impressed them all no end, and the two years spent in Europe at what I not untruthfully claim was the Sorbonne. I did spend some time at the Rue des Écoles, and once was caught in a riot with an architecture student whose arm the fleeks twisted and broke. So that qualifies me, more or less, and the schedule is undemanding. Twice a week, after field hockey practice, I come in and conjugate verbs. I teach idiom idiomatic expressions to and fail to improve the pronunciation of a bunch of spacey, space-age adolescents who all are doing drugs. Well, anyway, I'm standing at the stove. There's a knock on the porch door, and I say, come in, it's open. And in comes a man we know. His name is Michael Saunders. He runs the real estate office on Main Street, and he sold Adrienne the farm. She has money, understand, which is why she can afford to be so insouciantly a weaver. But her trust fund hasn't, hasn't helped us to establish solidarity with the suspicious locals. They wonder what we're doing here, and how long we'll remain. At night, in the cold, smoky rooms, we ask ourselves the same. So Michael has been driving by and thought he'd stop and say hello and ask how things are going and suggest, not incidentally, that if we want a buyer, he's got somebody who'll buy. Was it Spengler who observed, wasn't it Spengler who observed that we will know the decline of the West has been completed? when the children of the bourgeoisie turn to handicrafts? <laughs> uh, the answer class is yes, that's true. That's what Spengler said. Children, the decline of the West will be complete when the children of the bourgeoisie turn to handicrafts. But we turned in that direction, most of us, those years. 
We played the shakuhachi and wore bracelets with metal from down fighter planes and shouted up the pigs. We were convinced of Armageddon just around the corner. The times, they were a-changing, and we had to raise the food we ate and withhold that portion of our taxes that was earmarked for defense and warm our homes not with petroleum products but with the wood some honest yeoman cut. The living room fireplace smoked. That's the point of this discursus. I couldn't make it work. It was tall and wide and shallow and elegantly faced, and no matter what I did with it, the smoke poured out into the room. It was doing so just then, and Michael Saunders took a look and said, hey, that's terrific. You've got a room for your fireplace. I shrugged and said, so what? Adriana came into the kitchen wearing one of her sarongs. He had a thing for her, I think. Well, they all did, really. She was beautiful. He said, that fireplace, it's valuable, original. It's an extra added attraction. And I said it didn't work. <laughs> he looked at me with a veiled condescension we reserve for ignorance, or maybe he was showing off for sexy Adriana, unable or unwilling to accept that she was bored by men by just such macho preening, and announced it wasn't deep enough for the kind of fire we'd been setting. And, Here, ladies, let me help. Beside the tool rack for the fireplace, we kept asbestos gloves. Michael checked the flue. That ignorant I hadn't been. The flue was open wide. Adriana sighed and smiled at me, her secret smile that meant, let's tolerate this fool for just a little longer, OK? OK, I said, and turned back to the bread that I was kneading, setting out to rise in pans. And then something astonishing happened in Count Rumford's fireplace. Michael put on the gloves, I remember rolled up his sleeves to demonstrate a tattoo on his forearm of a mermaid and an anchor and reached, oh, bravely, manfully into the bed of ash and stood the smoking logs upright and the cherry wood and maple and the red oak slabs burst, hey, presto, into flame. And everything was heat. Um, I want to spend a good portion of the time that's left talking with you, hearing from you, answering questions. But I think I'm going to give you just a, one more taste of one more variety of language that's being used in this book. And this is Count Rumford himself when he, uh, when he writes. <coughs> As you perhaps already gathered, uh, he's not an entirely proper man. And he wrote uh, in his old age and retirement, imprisonment really, uh, something, an, an essay on the nature of order. Uh, there are five volumes still of Rumford's essays collected and reprinted. And they're interesting, mostly scientific documents. Uh, this one, which he was convinced was his masterpiece, was apparently so filthy that his daughter burned it and uh, didn't allow it to survive uh, his death uh, or his uh, sully his reputation it, yet again. Therefore, as any red-blooded American novelist would do, I wrote uh, his essay on order, and I hope to end with five minutes of filth. Um, uh, this is uh, Rumford's language, or I mean, it's my language, but it's how I imagine he might have written. Let me take a single instance, and he's talking about order. Uh, let me take a single instance of the universal process, love. Love is widely construed to be a phenomenon of great consequence, as tending to define the interaction of the species, whether a child for parent, parent for child, partner for partner, master for slave. Romance is a principal topic in discourse and story and dream. Argument and hatred, too, may be viewed as the absence of love. Poets sing of it, and playwrights put it on the stage, and painters represent its practice. There are few topics as common, and none it may be more so. The desire of two entities 
to commingle and conjoin is, one may fairly claim, a condition of existence as we know it, a sine qua non. Yet who has studied that condition with microscope and rule? Who with telescope and caliper has charted its course and arrival? Who can explain its origin or predict its course? Who may measure this abstraction except by its effects? What we know of love, or think we know, has long been written down in manual and guidebook, the procedures and their etiquette of them minutely described. And it is, of course, a relatively simple matter to measure the physical action of love, the blush on cheek, the flush on brow, the upright nipple and distended member, and in pleasures climacteric, the curled toe. What will strike the curious observer is far more curious, however, is the order that such passion necessarily entails. The sequence, as it were, of stimulus and subsequent response. These are various and many, as numberless it may be urged as the forms of love itself. A partial catalog must once again suffice. Four partners at one time would seem to the discerning practitioner most satisfying. All else is superfluity. In this arrangement, the mouth and hands and sexual organ each have their proper function and their place. Some subscribe further to the theory of the gratification of feet as being yet another extremity, and that the plausible limit of partners in Congress mounts, therefore, to six. But the attention wanders for force. The perfect focus of engagement is diffused by sheer extension, and though one may commend a gallant for his acrobatics, this is not the same as ardor. It is excess and consequent waste. For reasons heretofore reduced, three partners may prove sufficient. This is according to taste and leaves the right or left hand free to dangle emptily or be elsewhere employed. The rectangular arrangement is as satisfying and rather more symmetrical than the pentagonal. The triangular, two additional partners, may claim its adherence as well. If we love without requital, it is unrequited love. If we love in perfect harmony, it is as an instrument tuned. If we love in disproportion, it is comic when not sad, as when, say, a man plights his troth with a tree, or a woman vows fidelity forever to a crow. The old enamored of the young engender derision if wealthy, scorn if poor. The young enamored of the old and not of their possessions are few and far between. Brutality runs rampant in alley and kitchen and wood. Debauched exhaustion and satiety must be also considered. The Duke of Dorleans, I'm informed, had more mistresses than shoes, and of the latter, he could claim 300 pair. Fewer women would engage in sex if they might receive compliments standing. The soft flattery of courtship is best delivered from. But however strange or foolish the predicament of lovers seems to those untouched by Cupid's shaft, the stricken party to himself seems sane. It is this that Plato meant when speaking of the shadow self, and this the poet write of, poet wrote of when he writes of scars, sans wound. What does the suitor seek to find, if not a sense of order? What do we in that lovelorn state require but requital, as of particles made whole? The numberless varieties of love in this regard look similar. There's a tremor of expectancy, imbalance seeking balance, unrest portending rest. All else is merely detail, divergence and diversity within the common ground. All else is fireless smoke. Well, I could go on and Rumford does, but uh, another of us will. Um, I will spare you the other 473 pages. <laughs> and thank you very much for having listened to me. So. <laughs> Until this session should probably end a little less than half an hour from now, so you better have a question or three. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. I'd like to know what the publication date is. Um, I'm actually very happy to see this book here because it means it does exist. I thought I had the only uh, copy of it. The publication date 
has moved a little, but it's something like May 10th. It may be May 6th, it may be May 16th, but somewhere there, a couple of months from now. Well, everyone in this room can tell they've spoken that they were on the first to even here. <laughs> That's very uh, sweet. Uh, I um, yes, exactly. Tell your children. Tell your children's <laughs> children. To press their cold nose to the glass. Um, in all um, uh, truth, this is merely descriptive. I ain't gonna write a book like this again. <laughs> Among other things, it's. I don't think I have 22 more years uh, to uh, to work on the next. It has been, in some sense, the book of my life. I have been um, uh, spellbound by this particular figure, and I'm awfully damn glad to bring him at last to the book. May I ask you, sir, how you heard him? I uh, it come up in, I think it was the Age of Enlightenment. Exactly. Day, I think, I actually read the original, in, uh, I read the uh, read a story of, uh, I, I can finally recall, I had a couple of courses, but he came, comes across a lot in the French Revolution, the pre post revolution. I know that he goes to jail, I think, because of uh, some kind of a scheme he did, and he didn't put enough uh, metal in the cannons, and his cannons blew up. He is, what he does know, I think, is I think he's a creative differential equation for, uh, the, for describing the, for, uh, calculating the uh, projectile. The trajectory, on, on absolutely. That. absolutely. There's all kinds of stuff. I, mean, I think I got him out of a Maria Bold book. Well, he's, he's an important figure in the history of science. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, he did, for instance, disprove this notion of phlogiston, which was an ancient idea that, that heat was a sort of uh, element uh, that traveled from object to object. You just couldn't notice it. And he understood. Um, by born in the Emperor's canon, a lot about the nature of heat transmission. I won't bore you with it, but but he founded the Royal Institution of, of Science in London, for instance, which is still very much in play. Um, and there is every year a Rumford Medal given at Harvard. I mean, Enrico Fermi won it. So history of science people do know about him, and scientists all remember him. What interested me more about him, in a sense, was his personal and strange and private life. But um, you remember well. Well, I didn't get him this year of science. I got a professor uh, taught at this university was getting them works. OK, good. Yes, ma'am. We have a lot of students in beginning writing classes. Can you talk some about the beginnings of your you know, writing life and how you started, what, what, what some of the first things you wrote? Sure. Um, let me see. Um, writers do tend to take bits and scraps from their personal experience and uh, places they have been, people they've known, what have you, and transform them with any kind of life by the alchemy of art into uh, into something altogether other or at least only distantly related. Um, and so the, the girl uh, who lost her virginity in Winthrop House um, went to Radcliffe at roughly the time that I went to Harvard. Uh, a little later I, I was there. but. Uh, there was such a thing still as a parietal hour. Um, and so I was a student uh, at, at, I mean, I'm going to ask you an interminable length. Uh, uh, I was a student at Harvard uh, between my junior and senior years, I guess. I had a girlfriend uh, in town, and I wanted to stay in town. And uh, I knew that I would have to give my parents a good reason uh, or they'd make me leave and do something serious with, with that time. 
And I figured the easiest thing to do was take a creative writing class uh, because, you know, that way you didn't have to do any reading. Um, and, uh, and I figured the easiest one to take, the one on offer, was for prose fiction, uh, a prose fiction workshop, which uh, was a bit of a problem because I, I had never written any. <laughs> uh, like, uh, as I told you earlier, like any other self-respecting undergraduate, I wanted to be a poet, a, a, a folk musician, or a, a movie star. I didn't think one should bother with novels. Um, but I needed to produce something in order to get into this class, because it was being caught, caught, taught by a person. Uh, and I, this is simply true. I had never heard of him. Uh, he wasn't that famous yet. It was a long time ago. Being taught by a person called John Updike. Who, uh, who wanted to teach a summer school class to see how he felt about it. And I had to get into his class. So I had to um, uh, figure out what I was going to do. I remember going for a walk with a friend around the lake in Wellesley somewhere. And he said, well, what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to write? And I thought, clearly, I had a whole summer. I wasn't going to piss away my time on some silly little thing like Chekhov, short stories. I was going to write a novel. I had a whole summer. I was going to write Move Over Moby Dick. You know, and I said, I'll write a novel. And he said, great. What are you going to write about? Um, and uh, I remember having, at the time, a perception that still strikes me as accurate. I, I think that most first novels, at least by young men, or at least by this young man, are either the myth of Narcissus or the parable of the prodigal son. Um, and since I'd almost already had enough of the myth of Narcissus, um, I said, well, I'm going to write a novel that's just the parable of the prodigal son. I said, great, what do you know about it? Um, or, or about the landscape? I hadn't then been to the landscape of the promised land, and I, I didn't know really anything about it. But as it had happened the previous year, I'd been to Greece. And I figured, what the hell, that's close enough. You know, there, there are olive trees, and there are donkeys, and, and there's some rocks, and, and sand. <laughs> and uh, so I said, well, I'll, I'll write the parable of the prodigal son, and I'll set it in Greece. We're halfway around the lake by now. And he says, uh, modern or ancient? And that took a little while, because you know, to do ancient, I would actually have to do some research. Uh, but I figured. I I could get my parents to send me back again if I said modern, so I could get the street names uh, down right. Uh, and I said, uh, oh, it'll be, uh, it'll be uh, modern Greece. And actually, by the time I'd gotten around the lake, I had the plot for my first book. Um, I don't know how many of you have read The Parable of the Prodigal Son recently. Uh, it's brilliant and brilliantly condensed. It's three paragraphs long. The first is he, he leaves home. The second is he's away from home. And the third is he comes back. So um, I wrote a novel uh, as an undergraduate that was about a kid who left home in contemporary Greece, was away from home, and returned. And the first word I wrote for Updike was the first of my, of my first novel. and. When it was over, uh, I got it published, and that was that. I just sort of thought that's what you did, you know. Um, you wrote a book from start to stop, and it was easy, it enabled in some degree by, by the great template. Uh, one thing I did do was include the great original verbatim in the book, buried, um, so a sufficiently canny editor could have cut, you know, all the Delbico dross away and ended up with a powerful product of time. Uh, the epigraph was the first line for it, or so on. We were talking um, in the class this afternoon. The spring, spring and Fall has a template also, a great play by Shakespeare, um, The Witch's Tale. But uh, I haven't done that often in between. Uh, and it was kind of a comfort to return to it, to, to know that you're, you're up against um, what you hope is sufficiently well disguised greatness so that people won't compare you. But anyway, I wrote a, a novel that was um, a contemporary version of that. Uh, I should say that if I have any real fame as a, as a uh, writer, uh, it's probably that 
I'm the one who sent Updike kicking and screaming from the classroom. Uh, <laughs> he decided after one class uh, that summer that he'd never do it again and go back to Ipswich and try and make a living with his own prose. So uh, that, that result, uh, at any rate, uh, uh, bore fruit. Um, uh, I, I'm telling this tongue in cheek, but it's essentially true. I, I wanted to spend time with my girlfriend, so I wrote an all. Next question. Sir. Uh, you mentioned you spent a couple of years in Europe. Was that right? Mm -hmm. Do you feel that it's somewhat necessary to leave the place where you were born and raised to become a better writer? Uh, that's a hard one for me to answer, first of all, because um, I don't think there's a, you know, there's a particular game plan for which writers um, have to train in order to improve their work. I mean, some writers, think of William Faulkner, um, really never left home, or, or, I mean, took a trip or two, but whenever he wrote, wrote about places that were at, at a distance, he wrote about them badly. Um, and uh, there's a great English 18th century poet called John, John Clare, who, who, who literally went mad when removed from his home. So there are ways in which what I'm about to say isn't advice. But in my case, it, it, it's not a question that I could answer in the terms that you're asking, because I wasn't born in Europe. Um, it's, it's partly why I talk so funny. Um, uh, I was born and raised there. Uh, and it has something to do with my relation to the kind of conquered, I think. Um, I was born in England, came to live in uh, America. I have spent a certain amount of my time and life in France, and my parents were German uh, in origin. So uh, Count Rumford was born in America, moved to England, uh, spent a lot of time in Germany, and died in France. And, and I just felt the, the, a kind of ex-pattern relation to him. In general, and because one does finally argue from one, uh, one's own experience, I do think it's a good idea to get a little distance, even if what you want to do is write about what's close to home. Yeah, sure. Yes? Um, no, now, I mean, yeah. I mean, the first thing on the field is now, I mean, look, Harold Bloom, Harold Bloom, Harold, uh, Harold Bloom, right? Yeah. Better, yeah, even credit for right? He makes a point about, an author eating up of his, his mentor, sort of like the Eric Norton shoot. One of that uh, has the same kind of relationship to you, uh, between you and Harold, uh, you and uh, Benaz Malibu. Eating up his mentor. I don't mean, I, I, that was, in, I, yeah. I'm trying to say it quick, quicker than my brains or whatever. Um, I, I, he was very important to me, uh, Malibu. Uh, after that first book of mine appeared, uh, or as it was coming out, I, uh, I was told by someone that Malamore was leaving the little college of Bennington, Vermont, in Bennington, Vermont, uh, for a year, uh, moving, in fact, to Boston, and that his job would be vacant. And, you know, I was 23. I wrote them uh, with the invincible pretension of youth that surely of all the authors in America, I was the one who should replace Malamud. And to show you how crazy they were, uh, they believed it, and I went there. Um, so I replaced Malamud for a year, and then he stayed away for a year. And by the time he came back, I was sort of there, and we became close colleagues. It's, you know, the, the faculty wasn't much larger than the number of people in, in this store. But I spent a lot of time with him, and I edited his papers after his death, and so on and so forth. But I have to say that he was sufficiently separate from me, sufficiently different, uh, both as a um, human being and as art artist, that I never felt that we were in any kind of competitive ring together. I mean, he was much my my elder uh, uh, colleague, a kind of father figure in a way. And I didn't find myself needing to cut him off at the knees in order to 
uh, to grow up a little taller. Um, he uh, he's a great writer. Those of you who who don't know his his work, uh, I'll tell an ungenerous story. Uh, after his death, um, there was a panel assembled in his honor and his memory um, by uh, in City College in New York, where where he'd gone to as an undergraduate. And they invited a lot of fancy folk to talk. Uh, the critic Leslie Fiedler, the critic Alfred Kazin, names that may not mean much to you now, but meant a lot to us then. Uh, the critic Harold Bloom, which is why I'm thinking of this. Um, the author Harold Brodke. Um, and, uh, and Mary Gordon who I was the moderator of this event. So I kept you know, turning to people and saying, what do you have to say, sir or lady? Mary, who, who was raised um, in Catholic uh, and uh, in another gender, um, actually said, I tried to learn from his sentences, and I left it at that. But everybody else, in one way or another, said Malamud was nothing until I invented him. You know, uh, nothing till I discovered him, nothing till I interpreted him, nothing till I proved upon him as an Harold Brodkin. Uh, and I thought, no, that's not the way you're supposed to do this. Um, uh, and so, uh, so I hold his memory dear and unimprovable. Well, end of answer. Next question. <laughs> Please. Um, when we, in our class, read the chapter um, that was published as a story from Spring and Fall, right. and now you were talking about this a little to our small MFA group, but um, that, you said, was the first part that you wrote in the novel. Can you talk a little about how that became a novel, growing from that chapter? Did you write it as a short story, or were no? You I wrote it as the beginning, as the opening beat to a novel, and wondered if if it had legs, as it were, if mm -hmm. it would keep moving. Um, uh, I did talk about this a little bit in, in class, so I'm, I'm going to do it more rapidly now. Um, at a certain point, I'm not quite sure why. I just began to notice that a lot of people uh, of my age, roughly speaking, in, in the elder generations, were reconnecting to people they had known when young, uh, hooking up with their high school or their college sweethearts, uh, Googling old acquaintances and getting back in touch after 20-year lapses, 30-year lapses sometimes, and sometimes, indeed, often getting married to people that you know they hadn't seen since summer camp. Um, and I found myself thinking about why that should be. Um, it's fortunately not the case with me. I'm still married to my college sweetheart. Um, but uh, uh, but it, it was true for an awful lot of other folk uh, that I saw. And I just puzzled about that blend of knowledge that older age is supposed to confer on you with that bright-eyed innocence and that sense of possibility the first love always offers. And then I thought about a great play by Shakespeare which deals with love in old age. And when the two sort of hit together, I thought, hmm, I'm going to write about you know, my first love, in effect. Uh, my uh, early uh, dreams and and what relation, if any, they bear to present reality. This was never intended as an autobiographical book, and it isn't. I just borrowed the, uh, some of the data. Um, but I think in order to be sure that there was enough there, I, I thought I'd start at the, at the literal beginning. Mm -hmm. And that's the chapter that you, you read, and it's the chapter I wrote first. And I asked myself, once I'd built those two, would I want to stay in their presence for a couple hundred pages or a couple more years in the writing? And when the answer to that was in the affirmative, I kept going. 
this uh, phrase, keep going, um, is uh, about to become the phrase, going, going, gone. Um, it's almost 5.15, and all I really want to say, unless you want to ask something else, is thanks a lot. I will be happy to sign books if anybody wants to bring them to me for that purpose. And thank you for sharing with me, in fact, uh, the first verbal exposure of, of the Count of Concord, who I uh, trust will be all over the airwaves sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot.